All right, welcome to part two of the video. We're gonna finish up with the anatomy and then hopefully begin talking about some urine formation, but we'll see how far we get. We ended the first video beginning our discussion of the parts of the nephron. And we talked about the nephron, which is the functional unit. There's billions smushed into the renal cortex and there's two parts, the renal cortex, which is the round structure and the renal tubules, and then we added the function. So we said that the renal corpuscle is what filters the blood, and then it is the renal tubules that form the urine. So off we go. All right, and remember I said that in reality, the nephron isn't quite so pretty and perfect. In reality, all the nephrons are smushed together, but we use this as a way to help us learn the anatomy and what's really happening. All right, so now that we've established the two main parts of the nephron, we're going to be talking more about each of those parts. So we remember the first part was the renal corpuscle, and that's the round thing. Well, it turns out within the corpuscle, we have some specific structures, the glomerulus, the glomerular or Bowman's capsule, and capsular space. So this whole thing is the renal corpuscle, right? but we're about to talk about the specific structures that make it up. So the first structure is called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is a ball of capillaries. It's kind of a difficult word to say at first, but you'll get it. Glomerulus, it's a ball of capillaries. And then that ball of capillaries or glomerulus is encapsulated by the glomerular capsule or Bowman's capsule. I prefer to say Bowman's capsule, you might hear it both ways. And then between the two, there's a space and that is called the capsular space. So between the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule, anytime you see any space, that's capsular space. All right, so the specific structures of the renal corpuscle, the glomerulus or the ball of capillaries Bowman's capsule, which encapsulates the ball of capillaries, and then capsular space. Okay, now this is going to get a little tricky, but I'm going to do my best to try to explain it to you. The structures that I'd like you to know are the podocytes and the filtration slits. This picture on the right, is, it's a crappy picture. I really don't like it. Um, I'm going to instead be using a different picture. I'm going to come back to the screen because it gives us the definitions for the podocytes and the filtration slits. But I want to come to this screen. Okay. We know that the glomerulus is a ball of capillaries, right? And we know that that ball of capillaries, the glomerulus, is encapsulated by Bowman's capsule. Oh, it turned, all, turned it all black. Didn't know that was going to happen. That's fine. <laughs> the glomerulus or ball of capillaries is in the middle and it's encapsulated by Bowman's capsule. What if we were, I'm gonna switch back to red. Let's see if it lets me do red. What if we were to magnify the glomerulus and we were to really kind of spread out that ball of capillaries? Well, it turns out that between the capillary vessels are specialized cells called podocytes. Okay, between the capillary vessels are specialized cells called podocytes. So let me, let's change to black. It's almost like between the capillary vessels are these cells called podocytes. And these cells have little feet that come out. And those feet wrap around the capillaries. So on this picture here, not my bad drawing, but this drawing, this is the body of the podocyte, and it has feet that wrap around, it has feet that wrap around the glomerular vessels, the capillary vessels. 
All right, so between the, the capillary vessels that make up the glomerulus, we have these specialized cells called podocytes. The cell body's in the middle, and it has little feet that wrap around the glomerular vessels. That's where it gets its name, podocytes, because it has little feet. So if I go back, you can see podocytes, cells with little feet that wrap around the glomerular capillaries. All right, this picture is not so bad. You have the podocyte cell body with all the feet that come off and wrap around the glomerular vessels. Then we have the filtration slits. And the filtration slits are the slits that are formed between the podocyte feet. Filtration slits are the slits that are formed between the podocyte feet, what I've colored in blue. If I go back here, filtration slits, the opening between the podocyte feet. Filtration slits, opening between podocyte feet. And what we're gonna find out is that filtration happens through these large filtration slits. I almost said pores, because they're kind of like pores, but filtration happens through these large filtration slits. Spend some time with this, go back and listen again if you need, um, but podocytes and filtration slits. Everything else on this slide you don't have to know. Here's another picture which actually isn't so bad. Let's go to black. We have the podocyte body, and it has little feet, right? Little feet that come off of it. And in between the feet, I gotta do this again to change the color. In between the feet are the, uh, where's a good picture? Filtration slits. Kinda looks like little hairs almost. Okay, I've made my point. All right, uh, I'm gonna skip that for now because I wanna talk about the more specific structure of the renal tubules. So as we talked about, the second part of the nephron is a collection of tubules, okay? So we had the first part, which was the renal corpuscle, has the glomerulus inside, ball of capillaries, surrounded by Bowman's capsule with the capsular space in between. Now we have a series of tubules, the second part of the nephron, called the renal tubules. And they have specific names, so let's talk about them. The beginning region is called the proximal convoluted tubule. It's called proximal because it comes first. This arrow is showing us that as filtrate leaves the glomerulus, and we're going to talk about this more later, as filtrate leaves the glomerulus, it enters the tubules, and the first part of the tubules that it enters is the proximal convoluted tubule. So it's proximal because it comes first, it's convoluted because it's windy, and they're tubules. Then we have, oh, I'm still okay. Then we have the nephron loop or loop of Henle. I think it's pretty common to see this referred to as loop of Henle. And then within the loop of Henle, we have more specific structures, all right? So make sure you know all of these. We have the proximal convoluted tubule, the nephron loop or loop of Henle, and within the loop of Henle, we have a descending limb, ascending limb, and thick and thin segments. And guess what, folks? They're labeled for what they really are. The descending limb is this portion because this is the direction that filtrate's gonna move through it. And the ascending limb is this part because that's the direction that filtrate moves through it. If you're ever unsure, because we have already established that in reality, these nephrons aren't so picture perfect in how they're laid out. So you may not always be able to see this so clearly, but in order to confirm whether it's a descending or ascending limb, start from the glomerulus, look to see where it goes into the proximal convoluted tubule, and just follow it. And where it first comes down, that has to be the descending limb. Follow that down, and when it comes back up, that's the ascending limb. 
And then we have thicker segments. This will be a thick segment. And we have thinner segments. You don't have to know the type of epithelial tissue that makes up the thick versus thin. Just know thick versus thin segments. Okay, then we have the distal convoluted tubule. It's distal because it comes, because it comes later. It's convoluted and it's tubules. Lastly, we have the collecting duct. And this is what all the nephrons dump into. So the distal convoluted tubule of all the nephrons dump into the collecting duct. So you should know both of these. I mean, you know me, so you're not going to be talking about DCT. You're going to want to write out distal convoluted tubule. Just, <laughs> just saying. Here's some histology. I'm not going to ask you to label any histology. Uh, it's just here if you want to. It's also a nice throwback to AMP1 with the histology. Uh, in AMP1 in the tissue lab, you looked at a bunch of... Um, Sorry, I just lost my train of thought. For histology, for the kidney, you looked at this exact slide. And what you were looking at are these tubules because this was the slide we showed you for a simple cuboidal, one layer of cube-shaped cells. Again, I'm not going to ask you this, but this is a nice cross-section of the histology of all the tubules. And then the bigger circle is the glomerulus. Okay. All right. Now, a couple odds and ends for anatomy before we go into your information. It turns out that there are actually two types of nephrons. The most common type of nephron is a cortical nephron. And this is what we see most often. The cortical nephron is primarily in the renal cortex. So here we see a cortical nephron on the right. Most of it is in the renal cortex. Only a little tiny bit comes down into the medulla. Compare that to the juxtamedullary nephron. In the juxtamedullary nephron, which is less common, we have larger portions of the tubules that come down into the medulla. We're going to find out later that the juxtamedullary nephrons, because they extend deeper into the medulla, have a specialized function in that they can help us to concentrate urine more. But right now, let's just get the anatomy down. We have two types of nephrons. The most common is the cortical nephron, as the name suggests. Most of it is in the renal cortex. And then we have the juxtamedullary nephron, as the name suggests, juxtamedullary. A larger portion of it goes into the renal medulla. All right. Now, we haven't yet talked about the blood supply, the blood vessels around the tubules and the afferent and efferent arterioles. Let's just dive right in. We have the afferent arterial, efferent arterial, we'll talk about those first. Then we're gonna talk about the paratubular capillary and then the vasa recta. Remember, whatever it is I'm circling or underlining, imagine this is in red, what you need to know. Let's first talk about the afferent arterial. Afferent means going into. So let's get, our, let's get our bearings here. This is the renal medulla. And then the top is the renal cortex. If we think back to the blood vessels, we had the renal vein, or renal artery, segmental artery, interlobar artery, and then arcuate artery. Remember, arcuate artery goes around the arc. Coming off the arcuate artery is the interlobular artery. And now we get to the afferent arterial. The arterioles that come off of the interlobular arteries and feed the glomerulus are called the afferent arterioles. Afferent, going in. So you just look to see, look right at the interlobular artery and look for an arteriole to come off the interlobular artery into the glomerulus, afferent arterial. Now, we also have an efferent arterial. An efferent arterial, much like an efferent uh, nerve, leaves, leaves the brain. Efferent arterial leaves the glomerulus. Oh, 
We just got kicked off. There's my dog. Let me just log right back in here. We're still recording, so. All right, let me go back to where we were. A little time to recollect our thoughts. Okay. Oof. There we go. Let me do it again. Okay. Let's do the black. No worries. We had the afferent arterial, efferent arterial, paratubular capillaries, and vasa recta. We said the afferent arterial. We talked about the arcuate artery, interlobular artery, and then the afferent arterial goes into the glomerulus. On the other hand, the efferent arterial leaves the glomerulus. So I'm going to go on the right. The efferent arterial is what leaves the glomerulus. And this one is a little bit harder to see, but this one is leaving the glomerulus. Efferent means to leave. Okay. We can also see a series of capillary beds that surround the tubules. Let's change this to black. The peritubular capillaries are the capillaries that surround the renal tubules in the cortical nephron. That's the key. The peritubular capillaries, the name kind of gives it away, peritubular around the tubules. The peritubular capillaries are the capillary bed that surrounds the renal tubules in a cortical nephron. When we look at the juxtamedullary nephron, the name of those capillaries becomes the vasa recta in the juxtamedullary nephron. Vasa recta. Same idea, capillary beds that surround the tubules. But if it's capillary beds that surround the tubules in a juxtamedullary nephron, you're going to call it the vasa recta. If it's capillaries that surround the tubules in a cortical nephron, you're going to call it peritubular capillaries. I want to make one last point. Uh, let's go back to the white. The efferent arterial leaves the glomerulus, and actually the efferent arterial feeds right into our surrounding capillaries. The efferent arterial goes right into the surrounding capillaries. We'll see that more later, but pointing it out. Okay. One more kind of tough piece of business, but I know you're with me. I've got the utmost confidence. All right. There's a structure called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, and this is important. Let me give you some context to hopefully understand a little bit better. Let me, let's see, where do I have the most space? Not really anywhere. We'll make do. We know that we have the glomerulus, which leads into the proximal convoluted tubule, which leads into the loop of Henle, which leads into the distal convoluted tubule. What a terrible drawing. <laughs> it looks like a, a finger pointing down, or I don't know what it looks like. Nothing good, really. Well, what I'm trying to point out here is that the distal convoluted tubule comes back around and it pretty much comes into contact with the glomerulus. The distal convoluted tubule comes back around and it pretty much comes into contact with the glomerulus. So that's how I think it's best to define it. Juxtaglomerular apparatus. The junction between the distal convoluted tubule and the glomerulus. I know it says afferent and efferent arterial because those are there also, but I think it's easiest to understand if we define it this way. The juxtaglomerular apparatus, junction between the distal convoluted tubule and the glomerulus. Now be careful because this is the juxtaglomerular apparatus but we also had the juxtamedullary nephron. So just be careful, okay? I do like this picture, though, because it's going to make my point. 
Let's go back to this picture just for a second, a couple seconds actually. We have, I'm looking at the nephron on the right. This is the distal convoluted tubule. And look, it comes right around and it touches the glomerulus. So that junction between the distal convoluted tubule and the glomerulus is the juxtaglomerular apparatus. This is the proximal convoluted tubule, loop of Henle. And if you follow this, the distal convoluted tubule comes back around the glomerulus. And that junction is called the juxtaglomerular apparatus, junction between the distal convoluted tubule and the glomerulus. Why do we care about this? Because there must be a reason. We care about this because there are specialized cells that line this junction called macula densa. So here we have the distal convoluted tubule coming into contact with the glomerulus and lining this junction are specialized cells called macula densa. We're going to come back to the macula densa because it plays a role in regulation of the kidneys, but I just want to establish the anatomy. Juxtaglomerular apparatus, junction between the distal convoluted tubule and the glomerulus. And why do we care? Because there's specialized cells called macula densa that line this junction. And we're going to find out later that these macula densa play a role in regulation. Okay, a couple of last slides really quick just to review the rest of the urinary system anatomy. We've already established the ureters, right? The tube that carries urine from the kidneys to the bladder. Uh, it is retroperitoneal, um, but really just know the structure itself. We'll keep it pretty simple. The bladder, the bladder, we're gonna keep it pretty simple too. It's a muscular sac. Okay, there's the bladder. I want to point out a couple of things. The walls contain rugae, little folds. You can see little folds in there. Look at the little folds. They're kind of cute. Just like the stomach, those rugae allow for expansion. So when our bladder is full, the rugae will disappear. But if the bladder is empty, those folds will show up more. Um, that one down there. Okay, what I want to point out also, and this is a little harder to see, but we're going to do our best. What I want to point out also is that the ureters actually come behind the bladder and enter the bladder towards the bottom. They try and show you this because they try and show it a little bit shaded almost. But what, I'm, what I want to point out is the ureters come behind the bladder and then they enter the bladder almost from below. Another structure of the bladder is the trigone. The trigone is kind of a structural designation. So if we look at the urethral orifices, the urethral orifice, the urethral orifice is where the ureter comes into the bladder. They almost end up looking like eyes. And then we have a little funnel that leads down into the urethra. So if you were to link all those structures together, if you were to link the urethral orifices with the funneling of where the bladder goes into the urethra, I'm going to go to red, uh, maybe I'll go blue. It forms a triangle. And that triangular structure formed by the two urethral orifices and then the bottom funnel into the urethra, that triangular structure that you could make is called the trigone. Think about tri for three. Here's a better look. This is a better picture. Cha, so exciting, huh? Urethral orifice, urethral orifice. This shows how the ureters come behind the kidney excuse me, behind the bladder and enter it from below. So urethral orifice, urethral orifice, and then they kind of funnel down into the urethra. All together it forms kind of a triangular structure called the trigone. Lastly, here we have 
<clears throat> excuse me, we have the internal and external urethral sphincters, similar to the digestive system where we had the anal sphincters. The external urethral sphincter, let's see here, let's make this a little bit clearer. The external urethral sphincter is skeletal muscle involuntary. So this means that we can voluntarily decide when to contract or relax this to let the urine out. But then we have an internal urethral sphincter a little bit higher. This is a little bit different from the anal sphincters, which were kind of like internal and external. One was more towards the middle, medial, one was more lateral. In this case, one is higher, one's lower. Internal urethral sphincter is higher and it is smooth muscle, which tells us that it's involuntary. And the external urethral sphincter is lower and it's voluntary because it's skeletal muscle. This is an example of what I told you, one of the reproductive shared things within the male. So just comparing a male versus a female, the urethra is structured differently. Females, it's shorter. Males, it's longer. And in males, the same urethra at different times can transport either urine or semen. Here's a nice view of... Um, if I die in here, we can see the major and minor calluses feeding into the renal pelvis, feeding into the ureter, into the bladder. Kind of cool. All right, I'm going to end here because I don't want to get into urine formation. That's going to be our third video. I'll see you then.